everyone. Thank you for being here. Hi. Thank you, for, uh, President Alexade, for the opening video, which was really inspiring. Uh, my name is Margaret Rung. I'm the director of the Center for New Deal Studies and a professor of history here at Roosevelt University. And I'd like to welcome you to the 26th Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecture, which this year has been programmed within the American Dream Reconsidered Conference. I'm very grateful to be a part of this event and wish to thank the organizing committee led by faculty member Professor David Her uh, Ferris and Chief of Staff Michael Ford, as well as members Vanessa George, Executive Assistant to the President, Katora Brown of Special Events, and Monique Mitchell of Marketing. As always, a special thank you to our beloved Assistant Dean Julie Rowan, and to my extraordinarily able graduate assistant, Grace Mary Perez. Finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Center for New Deal Studies Advisory Board, my colleagues, students, and staff who have always supported this lecture. Thank you for coming. The aim of this lecture and the Center for New Deal Studies more broadly is to connect the legacy and ideals of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt who, for, who together forged a new path for the United States through some of its darkest years, the Great Depression and World War II. Now, more than ever, it behooves us to study their leadership and values as inspiration for finding a path forward in this fractured nation and world. The point is not simply to replicate their actions, because as we learned in this lecture last year, which focused on the Roosevelts and the Holocaust, the idea is that, of course, the Roosevelts um, had missteps and made mistakes, and so we're not necessarily replicating history, but rather what we're trying to do is embrace their ideals and their commitment to democracy as a blueprint for rebuilding our own. Today, we are honored to welcome the United Nations Deputy High Commissioner for for refugees, Kelly Clements, to address one of the most critical problems facing the world today, the vast displacement of people due to global climate change, endless wars, imperialism, brutal regimes, wealth inequality, and a host of other human manufactured problems. Her talk, Refugee Inclusion and the Future of Humanitarian Response, will provide us with insight and perhaps new paradigms on how communities with resources and powers should work with those without to improve humanity. How fitting for our university and this lecture to have a representative from the United Nations speaking to us. As we near the 75th anniversary of the founding of Roosevelt University, we are reminded of Eleanor Roosevelt's instrumental role in fortifying the college in its first decades placing her name and her resources behind it while she juggled other responsibilities toward another organization dear to her heart and also in its infancy, the United Nations. Her commitment to building and serving the United Nations, her contributions to drafting the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and her role as First Lady of the World underscore the connections between Eleanor Roosevelt, our university, and today's speaker. Indeed, Eleanor Roosevelt spoke forcefully about the question of refugees, or displaced persons, as they were referred to, at the end of World War II. She visited displaced persons camps in Germany in 1946, speaking with refugees, many of whom felt that they could not return to their home countries then under the control of the Soviet Union. She liked the, likened the experience to the ones that she had in the 1930s when she visited mining camps and residents wanted to give her information because she said, quote, they wanted their government to know and they had a right to tell their government, unquote. In DP camps, she said, there was no government to tell. There was no right to tell their story. Quote, there was just nothing to hold on to, she said. Charity is a wonderful thing, but it does not give one that sense of security. The sooner displaced persons can be taken where they can become citizens and feel that they are actually building a new life, the better it will be for the whole world." Unquote. As the UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, Kelly Clements has carried Eleanor Roosevelt's torch forward, 
A graduate of Virginia Tech with a BA and MA, Ms. Clements has devoted her career to international humanitarian programs. For many years, a member of the Senior Executive Service in the United States Department of State, she worked on refugee and migration issues from Asia to the Middle East to Europe. These efforts eventually led to her appointment as the UN Deputy High Commissioner for, Ref for Refugees in 2015. She has faced some of the most difficult humanitarian crises in the world. In response to a question of how she keeps moving forward in these difficult times, she responded, ultimately, it's always the individual conversations about fa people's families, about their hopes, their dreams, the smiles on the kids' faces. It's quite amazing. You go to a place where, from the experience that, experiences that they have lived through, people should be numb, but it's always the kids that somehow are the most resilient. They keep their families going, and the families continue to go because of their children. Throughout her service, Clements consistently has demonstrated a sensitivity toward the needs of individuals while simultaneously working toward the structural changes and reforms that must be made at the top levels in order to truly improve our humanitarian response to refugees. Ms. Clements' presence here today has special significance, not only because her commitment to social justice reflects the mission of our university, her father, Ronald Tallman, served as the dean for Roosevelt's College of Arts and Sciences for nearly a decade in the 1990s. He, along with associate dean and later dean Lynn Weiner, launched this lecture series in 1992 with Cokie Roberts delivering the first address. And he and Dean Weiner founded the Center for New Deal Studies. On a personal note, Dean Tallman was a historian. Uh, he was the dean when I was hired 25 years ago. Um, ever gracious and kind to me. He supported me in innumerable ways. I'm forever grateful for his collegiality, his silly sense of humor, um, and most especially the many ways that he propped me up early in my career. So it's an honor for me to introduce his daughter, Kelly Clements, as the 26th Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Distinguished Lecturer. Please join me in welcoming her. I'm a little bit speechless with that introduction and a little bit teary already, and I haven't even begun. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, President Malik Zedeh, um, Dr. Rung, Dr. Weiner. Uh, indeed, this is a special privilege to be here. It was actually 24 years ago that I introduced, at that time, the distinguished lecturer, uh, Ambassador Morton Abramowitz, who was a career Foreign Service officer and served in some of the toughest places in the world and in some of the biggest refugee crises. And obviously my, my father at that uh, point was dean, so there was a personal connection as well. But it was when I was really embarking on a, a career that has become a lifelong passion. So it is with special pleasure to be able to be here to share some of that with you. Um, I'll talk a little bit about refugee inclusion, but I hope at the end we can, we can answer some, have some discussion and, and Q's and A's. Um, my, my father actually points to his experience here, the decade that he spent uh, at Roosevelt as one of the, the best of his academic career, the most challenging, the most rewarding, um, and the people that he was surrounded by and the students that he taught and mentored uh, were legacies that clearly live on. So thank you, and thank you for that very special introduction. So I want to introduce you to Sujay. She's from Venezuela, but a couple of months ago when we met in Colombia, where she has been for the last two years, she's a young mother of four. She invited me into her home. It's a, clo a cozy place on a sandy beach. This is her, her front porch here. It's no, long, no more than 100 meters from the Caribbean Sea, where she explained to me how and why she fled. Sujay is from Maracaibo. It's the second biggest city in Venezuela, once the country's oil powerhouse. It's now a microcosm of the country's slow implosion in recent years. As Venezuela's remaining resources are diverted to Caracas, the rest of the country is, has seen the supply of basic needs like water and electricity and medicine evaporate over time. 
When you talk to Sujay about why she left Venezuela, this is where the story begins. A lack of services, a shortage of fuel, the rising cost of that fuel, no food, but after an hour, a long time to chat with a stranger, but a remarkably short time to share your life story. She starts to open up about the layers of issues that forced her to move. The rampant violence, frequent theft, widespread extortion by gangs, vigilantes, paramilitaries, even the slightest perceived political affiliation with the opposition can land people on a blacklist, cutting off your access to work and food. In Colombia, Sujay and her family have access to the basics. They can move freely and go to the market. They have stable housing, thanks to a piece of land they rent from the local community. It may be an informal settlement comprised of roughly 15 families in total from Venezuela, but it enables her kids to attend a nearby school. And with this stability, they can enter the informal economy. Her husband finds odd work as a builder, plying the same trade he did back home, and Sujay herself, trained in food preparation and management in Maracaibo, has enrolled in an entrepreneurial program. She not only wants to open a shop like the one that she had, complete with a Coca-Cola refrigerator and an ice cream stand, but she wants to give herself the tools to thrive. Sujay's story is a happy one. When she, when, while she spoke with great pain about what she had lost, for years they moved back and forth across the border, trying to hold on to life in Venezuela before ultimately settling in Colombia. Things are better now. Her kids are in school, she and her husband are working, and the family has a plan for the future. Life is not always easy, but there's safety and security and a reason for optimism. Sujay's story is also about access, not only to safety, but to the building blocks of that plan. Access to health, education, to work, and skill development. It was particularly apparent that having the means to generate income was fundamental for the family not only in terms of being able to feed and clothe themselves, but to enable their resilience and afford them the ability to contribute actively in their pursuit of a solution. But her story is not necessarily representative of all refugees, not even in the region. There are similar stories of refugees around the world. Some of the most remarkable people I've met are refugees, but the access which enables Sujay's stability is local in the most absolute sense. Their family depends entirely on a small Colombian community, absorbing a handful of Venezuelan families, principally from an indigenous group that spans across the border. The generosity of the host community is inspiring, but the absence of the state in supporting refugees in the area is equally notable, especially as people continue to arrive by the thousands. Communities opening up to displaced people occurs all over the world and local authorities play a crucial role in creating the conditions for hosting those refugees. Throughout South America, we met with mayors and prefects who were not only setting the tone for inclusion of Venezuelan refugees and migrants, but actively developing projects and mobilizing uh, resources to integrate new arrivals into their communities. The newly elected mayor in one small Ecuadorian border town had already taken it upon himself to contact the World Bank in his first week on the job. And I heard yesterday from Mayor Barrett uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, of Milwaukee's similar efforts to integrate newcomers. The lesson is not to narrow our focus on the local level, but rather to broaden the scope of engagement with stakeholders in these countries, deconstructing the impulse we have as the UN Refugee Agency to historically concentrate our efforts on the national level. While we have a greater appreciation now of the integral role that host communities and local authorities have, we cannot absolve national and international actors of their responsibilities either. They remain essential to meeting the challenge of this scale. People continue to be displaced, needs continue to rise, and solutions continue to be elusive. Already this year, we hit a milestone when more than four million people officially left Venezuela in a crisis that is increasingly defining a generation and a region. We've also witnessed deteriorating conditions in and around countries like Libya, where I was two weeks ago, and across entire regions such as the Sahel and the Lake Chad Basin. More than 70 people, excuse me, 
more than 70 million people, are now displaced around the world, a substantial increase on numbers a decade ago. To put this into perspective, the global displaced population is greater than the populations of California and Texas combined. But these are more than numbers. 70 million individuals like Sujay are personally paying the price of war, conflict, and persecution. These rising numbers are an undeniably part of an established and indelible trend by two broad baskets of issues. On the one hand, the proliferation of complex drivers of displacement. For example, conflict-driven emergencies that are symptomatic of wider geopolitical issues. Climate and environmentally driven displacement, which will only proliferate in years to come. And governance-driven crises, where poverty, resources, and inequality foment extremism and violence. These are all interlinked and increasingly long-term challenges, which only become more difficult to reverse as time goes on. On the other hand, there's a perennial challenge of securing solutions to end displacement. Last year, 13.6 million were newly displaced. That's 37,000 people every day. But only 2.9 million returned home. And while 81,000 were resettled to a third country, a very small uh, percentage of the overall population. That is the delta and why the need keeps rising as refugees get stuck in camps, lost in cities, or simply keep moving. Without an immediate solution, refugees, like the rest of us, invariably seek opportunity. If they can't find it across the border, they continue to move. We saw this in 2015 when more than a million refugees and migrants crossed the Mediterranean in search of safety and aid in Europe. Almost 85% of those arriving were from the world's top 10 refugee producing countries, including Syria and Afghanistan. People on the move is also a pattern we've witnessed for decades. We saw it in the 1990s when Liberian refugees spent days at sea, rejected by one West African country after another. If we go back even further, this resembles the Indo-Chinese boat crisis in the 1970s. We also see this now in South America as those who are unable to find opportunities that Sujay and her family have just across the border in Colombia. They move further south down the Andean corridor to Ecuador, to Peru, to Chile. People stop when they have access to what they need and remain when they seek and receive safety and opportunity. A key driver of continuously southward movements from Venezuela is that communities further north in the continent are saturated with newcomers and lack the support needed to host millions of Venezuelans. Indigenous schools like the one Sujay's children attend cannot absorb thousands of young students, nor should we ask communities to bear that responsibility alone. I would argue, therefore, that refugee response should recenter around inclusion in communities where they are displaced, inclusion in the absence of imminent return, inclusion for those seeking opportunity in displacement, inclusion for refugees who bring skills, capacities, and ambitions with them even when they leave so much behind. That is why we at UNHCR believe the future of humanitarian response is built around a more comprehensive model of response and that the success of this approach depends upon a broad and diverse coalition of partners and stakeholders at the international, national, and local levels. That paradigm shift is at the core of what has now been called the New Deal for Refugees, the Global Compact for Refugees. We should start with social inclusion because it's access to essential services, which is usually what frontline humanitarian aid work delivers. In its most immediate form, refugee response is about saving lives and protecting people. And traditional humanitarianism has naturally focused on addressing those basic needs in crisis. But that short burst reflex is best applied for days and weeks, not years and decades that typically characterize modern displacement. So our new approach to social inclusion is about right-sizing the short-term component of aid delivery and pivoting as early as possible towards sustainable approaches focused on integration into national systems. In this regard, we take education as an example. 
as efforts to include refugees in national education systems are reflexive of a global shift in the direction of the industry. Many refugees struggle with access to basic education. Today, only 63% of refugee children attend primary school, primary school, compared to a global average of around 91%. The gap only widens as you move up a level, with only 24% of refugees enrolled in secondary school versus 84% globally. Rather than focusing only on the emergency education, there's now broad recognition that refugees should, even during the emergency phase of response, be planning several years down the line, that we should be doing that planning. This entails medium to long-term interventions aimed at embedding social services for refugees within the national system, rather than having parallel short-term crisis intervention. Our role at the UN Refugee Agency is to facilitate the creation of conditions that are productive and beneficial to both refugees and host communities, building the business case for an integrated approach that contributes to national capacity and reach. A key lesson that we've learned, especially as the majority of refugees are in neighboring countries in the global south, is that host communities frequently face comparative, comparable uh, challenges, both in accessing, but also participating in education, especially at the post-primary levels. Strengthening existing education systems rather than investing in temporary and unpredictable parallel systems for refugees, therefore benefits children and youth in the entire area. Such an approach is also more sustainable, providing better quality education and ensuring that people learn what people learn is recognized and certified. In previous decades, refugee education was managed by the humanitarian community, with UNHCR as a fallback option when partner funding ran out. But such mechanisms were not only frequently of lesser quality, but had fewer mechanisms built in for completion and certification. Worse, in instances where the quality of refugee-only education was better, the resentment of host communities and local communities undercut efforts towards social cohesion and peaceful coexistence. To effectively anchor these interventions within the national system requires project design, implementation, and monitoring partnerships with the ministries in line with their standards and regulations and in concert with national education policy. Already in 22 of our country operations, Ministry of Education officials and key partners have participated in collaborative trainings on refugee inclusive and crisis sensitive approaches. We have some good examples of how refugee inclusion in education can work as well in Chad. 108 schools in 19 refugee camps have been declared official Chadian schools, not refugee schools. The number of refugee youth admitted in the Chadian baccalaureate has increased by 600%. More than 500 refugee teachers have received qualification certificates from the Chadian Ministry of Education. In Turkey, the revision of education laws and policies have enabled 600,000 Syrian children and youth to go to formal schooling, including 20,000 in higher education. And in Rwanda, Paisantan School, located next to uh, the Mahama refugee camp, hosts more than 21,000 refugee and host community students, and it's the biggest school in Rwanda. Like their host community counterparts, refugee students are eligible for Rwanda's School of Excellence program, and in 2018, over 400 refugee students were offered places in secondary schools for gifted and talented students. Although this approach may be more sustainable, Efficient, cogent, education is never cheap. To, impl to implement inclusion-based approaches requires significant investment in national education systems to address immediate and longer-term needs. The alternative short-burst funding for emergency refugee education only is no longer cheaper and contributes nothing to these countries. Integrated education programs can also help close the labor gap between refugees and host communities as well. The challenges regarding access to primary and secondary school carry over to post-secondary and basic skills development. Only 1% of refugees attend university compared to 37% globally, cutting almost all of them off from a huge segment of the local labor markets. 
So while the right to work is enshrined in, the, in, in international law, including in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1951 Refugee Convention, access to labor markets has long been a challenge for refugees. In pursuing labor inclusion, therefore, our focus is on creating an enabling environment for refugees to participate and contribute to the economy. By securing the right to work, freedom of movement, the ability to use their assets, register a business, and have their documents recognized. One creative option we've explored is through mobility schemes, which allow refugees to fill labor shortages in industrialized countries. Given the education skills and levels of the majority of refugees today, this often entails low-skilled jobs, such as elder care and the service industry. But even that contributes to self-reliance, provides valuable capital to access other opportunities for growth and development, and serves as a building block for the futures of these families. Much ink has been spilled around the world of work, how technology and innovation continues to transform the economy and disrupt the labor market in the developed world. But unfortunately, as exciting as that is, 85% of refugees are hosted in developing countries dominated by the informal jobs in agriculture, construction, and services. The jobs of the future are still out of reach for most refugees, even those with access to work. There are simply limited opportunities for refugees to become part of the digital economy, and it is also not yet a scalable solution for us at UNHCR. We have some small pilots in South Asia where people have stronger language skills and training uh, in that subsector of the economy. Well, in the Middle East, where many refugees have left middle-income countries, like Syria and Iraq, we have individuals who work in coding and provide services in micro work sites. But these are small local pilots, not comprehensive national programs. Expanding these opportunities would require much greater investment to overcome the barriers to access for refugees. In this case, it's often about infrastructure, as most forcibly displaced people are living without connectivity and therefore unable to participate in the global economy. Globally, refugees are 50% less likely than the general population to have an internet-enabled phone. And the cost for internet in refugee hosting areas is often inflated as well. One recent study suggested refugees often spend up to a third of their income on staying connected, a third. Access alone does not equal inclusion, though. The priority remains to give refugees the skills to meaningfully participate in the economy of the present and the future. Let's go back to Rwanda. We're partnering with Kepler, a nonprofit higher education program that provides access to uh, excellent higher education. Roughly a quarter of their students are refugees. And their online bachelor's program includes in-person coaching, digital literacy training, health and financial support services, and career preparation, with an emphasis on graduates applying their skills to meet labor market needs. The results have been encouraging, as 90% of graduates find full-time employment or continue with further education within six months. Where access to work meets inclusion is financial services. We partner with sustainable and socially responsible financial service providers willing to offer a variety of services to the refugee population. These services may include credit for income generation activities, housing, consumption, and education, savings accounts, or even loans for the most vulnerable, remittances and payment services, as well as insurance. The objective of this strategy is to overcome the old model that UNHCR has been following for years of direct inter intervention through grants and pursuing revolving loans from us to these financial service providers. The broader shift is towards UNHCR playing the role of convener, a hat we are increasingly wearing in various sectors. You may have noticed that among financial service providers, investors, and refugees in the examples that I've used here today. While we can still provide grants to help set up small businesses when needed, the idea is to connect sustainable financial service providers who then continue engaging with refugees long after our support ends. We generally take three steps. First, we raise awareness about the financial needs of refugees by organizing discussions with the most prominent financial service providers in the country. Second, 
we organize focus groups and individual interviews with refugees and potential financial service providers. This allows the potential partner to present their model, ask their own questions, and explain the terms and the conditions of their business, for example, regarding interest rates. The third step is pursuit of a partnership agreement with inter interested financial service providers, which involves UNHCR sharing basic contact information. Once the information sharing and logistical support are provided, we step back and let the refugees work directly with the financial service providers while maintaining a degree of monitoring and oversight. A fundamental principle of the above model is that we do not make direct financial contributions to these providers. We facilitate, we convene, but we do not subsidize, even from the start. This would undercut the sustainability of the model. We simply enable the service provider to see the business case for extending, offering, and adapting their services to refugees. There are a number of countries where we've seen this work, in Morocco, Albania, Argentina, and even in Tunisia, where I was a couple of weeks ago. What we learned in Tunisia was that the main barrier uh, to access was actually a lack of knowledge and understanding by the providers of this untapped market. In fact, unlike the labor market in most countries, there are no laws that impede microfinance institutions to offer credit to refugees. None of the aforementioned countries, however, host large refugee populations. And to launch these partnerships where a number of refugees may be in the hundreds of thousands or even millions requires more complex partnerships. Developing a large-scale partnership, for example, with the Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation, for example, involved bringing the Swedish uh, International Development Agency, CEDA, to the table and conducting comprehensive market assessments in places like Uganda and Jordan, countries which combined host two million refugees. Pursuing financial inclusion for refugees on that scale requires a combination of partners working together to extend a range of services. In this case, the model combines access to debt funding at good market rates by lenders with a guarantee by CEDA to investors and technical assistance from CEDA and to UNHCR to the financial service providers. The desired outcome, however, is all the same. We want to offer credit, savings, remittance services to refugees and enable the providers to adapt them to large refugee populations based upon credible business models. With each of these, there are, of course, informal community-run analogies. For the most vulnerable refugees without capital, for whom accessing a formal financial institution is not an option, we want to more actively facilitate creation of self-run savings groups that can help them to get a start. We have experience with this in places like Tanzania, where more than 100 community savings groups have been established. Once again, a major question in regards to inclusion-based programs is scale. Part of the challenge is resources, and we continue to invest in not only raising our own funds, but also mobilizing others, including international financial institutions like the World Bank to prioritize these communities who are hosting refugees. But it is also a question of approach, and our ambition is to pull these various pieces together and cut through some of the challenges of scalability through digital inclusion. We've already referenced here today a range of digitally enabled opportunities, including free internet libraries, easily accessible to those looking to learn and study. This connects, of course, to connectivity and infrastructure, these issues are relevant there too. Nonetheless, there's been considerable interest and progress from governments and the private sector to support digital inclusion for refugees, including coding, digital design, investing in digital employment, and that can be carried out in borderless, virtual workplaces. We have identified a joint approach to employment policy as critical to allow a digitally disenfranchised group the opportunity to work. Access to digital technology has already enabled refugee students globally to engage with higher quality learning platforms and university programs. We are part of a connected learning consortium and implement a wide range of partner projects that seek to use digital learning methods and improve education and digital skills. At the core of our digital strategy is digital identity, which we believe has the promise to deliver a fast track approach, a fast track to inclusion. Nearly one billion people worldwide are unable to prove who they are. 
one billion. That's one reason why the Sustainable Development Goals provide all people with a legal identity by 2030. Not surprisingly, this is yet another area where access for refugees is a challenge. We make every effort to ensure that our population registration systems is interoperable with host states' population registries and support governments in building capacity around digitalization. In Jordan, for example, refugees are able to authenticate their identity using biometric iris scans at enabled ATMs before receiving their digitally distributed cash assistance. These ID-based innovations not only facilitate access, but encourage autonomy and self-reliance. If not only, it not only allows them access to services and opportunities in exile, but allows them to maintain access to their, their identities upon return. There's a world of work on digital identity and our thinking continues to evolve. Right now, we're focused on, on two areas. First, a self-managed identity that empowers the individual refugee to decide with whom they share that information. For examples would be partners in order to receive assistance with UNHCR for protection purposes, with academic institutions for education opportunities, and with health practitioners for health services. However, an individual can't establish his or her own identity. For most people, a self-managed identity is based on processes and documents issued by governments. So second, for those who do not have access to government-endorsed identities, often involving refugee populations, this is frequent, their claims should be strengthened by what the industry call trust authorities. And it's our view that the duality of allowing people to have agency over their own identity and UNHCR strengthening identity claims by acting as a trust authority will allow refugees uh, digital identities to be recognized by governments, businesses, and other relevant institutions. And they'll then have greater control over their own lives. All of this while ensuring that data protection safeguards are built in with international standards. So these four components that I've just mentioned to you here this afternoon, social, labor, financial, digital, is our approach to inclusion that's baked into this global compact on refugees. The model we are implementing now is the comprehensive refugee response framework in various countries. And we've been doing this for the last several years. Not only are we increasingly validating, adjusting, adapting our approach as we roll it out, but we're also more attuned to the risks posed by a failure to succeed in our collective shift towards refugee inclusion. Nowhere is this more blatant than Libya. Thousands of refugees are in detention in Libya. Many have failed attempts to cross the central Mediterranean to Europe. They are at risk of, and many have been, exploited by smugglers and traffickers. Although there are mixed flows, and some are moving for purely economic reasons, large numbers of those on the move through Libya get caught up in this network of deplorable detention centers and their refugees and their asylum seekers, many of them. Many of them are like Asma, an inspiring Somali refugee who I met last month at a UNHCR facility in Tripoli. Originally from a country that has been in conflict for nearly 30 years now, Asma has also lived as a refugee through wars in Yemen and Sudan. She has failed to find stability in exile and like many others has continued to move north in search of opportunity. Our collective failure to deliver that to her has led to the most extreme outcome, detention in a de facto prison located in yet another fragile state, Libya. In Asma's case, she will hopefully now resettle to a third country, uh, thanks to our team in Tripoli, but this is a solution for hundreds, not thousands, let alone millions of refugees around the world. People often refer to the global refugee crisis citing examples like Asma and others who move across the Mediterranean or through Mexico as examples. They are right, there is a crisis, but not because of the numbers. The rise has been slow but steady for decades. The crisis is really in how we respond. The old model does not work and it has not worked for some time. So this shift to a more comprehensive inclusion-oriented model is not only preferred but essential and frankly, long overdue. With crisis comes opportunity, which is where I would close with a parallel to the New Deal. 
the brilliance of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, the reason for its enduring legacy, is because of how it connected a series of complex and interconnected problems, debts, wages, mortgages, an entire financial system, with a comprehensive and systematic rather than reactive, reductive solution. As President Roosevelt said, there is no magical solution to problems of this scale. To him, there were two options after the Great Depression, either to intervene or let core problems persist. He chose the former, of course, to reestablish confidence in the future. And this is, in the sense, the boiling point we reached with the European displacement crisis in 2015, the fork in the road that led us towards the Global Compact and the hard fight towards a new future for refugee response. This isn't a palliative treatment, but a reprogramming of the entire humanitarian system around inclusion, resilience, and planning. To quote the former president, the actual accomplishment of our purposes cannot be achieved in a day. We will make mistakes and we won't always get a hit. But step by step, we are on the right path and we believe in the results of this approach will deliver for refugees in need around the world, making it a better place for all. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think I stuck to 45 minutes, so we have a few, some time for some questions or comments. And we have. There's one right here, too. I'm particularly intrigued with Australia and how they're keeping so many migrants on an island with no hope of leaving after six years. How do we? ever do anything with a, a country like that, or how do we convince them to let more people in? Well, in fact, it's a, uh, Australia is an interesting example. Big challenges, as you've identified, with regard to protection um, and with regard to the, the right to seek asylum uh, and, and the right not to be refooled, as they say, sent back to potential persecution in countries from which they fled. This is a very delicate discussion, obviously, we have with governments around the world uh, in terms of treatment, treatment of migrants, treatment of refugees, and some of these fundamental principles. Um, we, uh, on the other hand, uh, with regard to Australia, they're one of our largest supporters in terms of the global refugee and uh, humanitarian programs around the world that we support. Uh, for example, there are nearly a million Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, they're one of our largest donors in terms of some of the protection and core programming that we put into place and support, obviously, for the Bangladesh government trying to make some kind of a home uh, for these million people until they're able to go back voluntarily. So it's, it's, it's not an easy dynamic by any means, but we work on this uh, quietly and carefully and, and try to convince governments and, and communities to do the right thing. Lots of hands. <laughs> Uh, thank you for coming. I wanted to ask you about the digital identity piece, sure. the iris scans in particular. Um, what choice do refugees have to do or not do, uh, hand over this biometric data? Like, are they, how are they responding to that process? Are they raising questions about it? What kind of choices do they have? And then secondly, like, what are the security protocols around that biometric data? No, very good question. So. The, as I mentioned, this is all with a data protection lens, and we're probably one of the agencies with the farthest reaching policy when it comes to this, because it's critically important that we keep people's information safe, particularly when we're dealing with a population that if the information gets into the hands of the persecutors, uh, could lead to their own demise. So this is extremely important for us. For us, there's a, there's a process of lots of information, lots of counseling, and informed consent. You know, so in terms of what we do with the information, how we keep it safe, what it's used for, uh, and what, in fact, it will allow them to do with it. Uh, and in the case you, you saw up on the screen, the, the picture of the woman who was looking into the, in, into the, the eyepiece, in the, uh, some parts of Jordan, and in particular the two largest refugee camps, but also in some of the urban areas, refugees can go into grocery stores, for example, 
and they basically will, uh, that will allow them to have their information instantly read. They know on their wallet, which basically comes up digitally on a screen, how much uh, resources that they have to spend on that particular day. They could decide to spend all of it or just a little bit of it. But it has also allowed them, I think, greater independence to be able to decide how they're going to be able to, to, to use the resources available to them. Do they pay rent? Do they buy a new winter coat for their kids? Um, or is food the more pressing priority? And this, through a, a system which is a much more efficient system for us to distribute goods, rather than giving in-kind with jerry cans or blankets or food that, that perhaps are not necessarily what they need in the moment, this allows them the choice. Um, overall, it's been a very popular uh, and uh, uh, good response in terms of the people that we're serving. But we're constantly uh, vigilant in terms of making sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. So one up in the front, too. Oh, me? OK. Hi. Um, Hi. I would like to send warm regards to your father. <laughs> <laughs> My name is June Lapidus. I've, um, I have very fond memories of working with him. Thank you. So I'm really struck by the um, contradiction between the local self-help kinds of initiatives and the, the rise of nationalism around the world of this is our country and we don't want to let anybody else in. And so when you talk about refugees in Australia, and when you were describing camps in Libya, I couldn't help but think about camps on our own borders. Mm. And I'm wondering how and in what ways UNHCR is involved in, in some of that. Sure. No, it's, um, it's interesting. You, the, the, the connection in terms of self-help and contributions that refugees make to communities sometimes, oftentimes, are lost in this political and deeply dividing uh, issues. And uh, unfortunately, we've seen, particularly in the last four to five years, uh, a, a deepening of some of the trend lines of using refugees as a political issue. Now, a former uh, mentor boss of mine once said, well, of course, what about refugees isn't political? Uh, it's a deeply uh, political issue. People are leaving from broken governance systems, human rights violations, et cetera, and we need, we need governments and, and authorities to come together to solve some of these problems for us. Um, so it's, it is something in terms of the, the dynamic uh, globally, and not certainly not just in this country, but in other countries as well, where you see the protection space for people to be able to seek asylum, to be welcomed into communities, and so on shrinking. But if you take it down to, the, to a local level, there are, there are some of those glimmers of hope. Now, you mentioned the border areas and that, the border, and that's, that's quite difficult. From our perspective, we, we maintain a, a, a strong uh, dialogue with the administration, offering our assistance, our support in terms of finding ways where you can deal with some of the challenges, particularly when you're looking at migration or refugee flows in a regional perspective. Um, and when it comes, for example, to Central America, we've got a, um, a very uh, rich program that six countries within the, the region have signed on to, to provide support to communities locally, um, those that may be coming from Honduras or El Salvador or elsewhere, keeping the aid at the local level there that may force some, if they don't have the aid, to, to start moving, as I mentioned in my remarks. If they don't have what they have in the place that they have, they will move. Um, but there are ways that we can address some of these issues uh, together and more comprehensively, as opposed to uh, more restrictive immigration or, or border policies. And that's something that we continue this discussion uh, at a global level particularly now when we've got the needs of over 70 million people that we need to respond to. And it is possible to respond, but we've got to do it together, and we've got to do it not singularly or unilaterally, but multilaterally. Hi. Hi. So I think that um, from what we've seen from the lecture, you guys are taking very positive steps towards helping people on the local level and addressing the issue of the problem. My question would be regards to the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. So 
a lot of what you've mentioned has to do with uh, broken governments and that's why refugees flee. So my question would be, in what ways is the UN able to hold superpowers and other governments who engage in activities to destabilize certain governments to account um, to address the cause of the issue rather than the effects of the issue? Um, you're addressing a question a little bit uh, beyond my scope as a humanitarian agency representative. Let me just say that first of all. But I did allude, and I feel strongly about this, that it is, we do need political leadership. And we do need uh, not just governments, but those actors at multiple levels to come together so that we can you know, see a solution to displacement. Because people are largely not going to go back until it's safe, and until they feel like they're not going to have to flee again. You see in a situation, for example, like Syria, which is, continues to be the largest driver of displacement, with over 5 million refugees, most have not gone to Europe or North America or further afield, most have stayed right close to Syria because they want to go home and they want to keep a tether to their, their home um, and you know return when they can to check on their property, see how their family members are doing, this sort of thing. So it is, I think, you know, in terms of solutions, it's a very local response, but it does take uh, political leadership at the most senior levels of governments, including those on the Security Council, uh, so that we see some progress on, on some big conflicts, because right now we're not seeing a lot of solutions. Thank you. I didn't even see you in the second row. This is, this is one of my oldest friends who started at the State Department in 1990 with me. <laughs> who lives in the area. <laughs> Welcome back, Kelly. Thank you, Phil. I was curious, understanding a, a, a lot about your background and, and your current position. What two or three things would you recommend to the audience that we do as oh. students? All right. It's a great question. It sounds like that was a good question, so <laughs> thank you. Um, there are all kinds of things you can do. You can uh, contribute at your local church to a family that may be in need. You can talk about the refugee situation as not something that's happening you know, thousands of miles away, but something that impacts us as a country, as a community, but in human terms. Because I think one of the reasons that we see people talk a lot, I used a few numbers in, the, in these remarks, but hopefully not too many, because we tend to talk about a lot of numbers. And you know, as, as um, Dr. Rung had mentioned before, you know, I've, I've been known to say you kind of become numb with the numbers. So talk about the humans. Talk about their stories. Do you have a, do you have a, a, a friend or a member of your community who's, who's been through something horrific? Have a conversation about it. Just bring some people together. Figure out a way that you can make an impact on an indiv individual life, or you can do something more broadly. Um, I think there are at the local, the national, the international levels, there are ways to get engaged. Uh, but walking away or being just bedazzled in not a positive way by some of the stories we see on the front pages of the paper or on our iPad every morning, um, it, do something about it. I mean, because I think the, it, the, the more immune we get, the worse the problem is. And I think if, yes, it touches us, perhaps not personally touches us, but it will affect us. Um, and if we can affect others, I think then there's room for action. Thank you. <laughs>